Okay, let's see here. Oh, Isha, Sister Sadia is waiting. Didn't realize that. Okay, we're about to be going live soon. I'll provide uh, this link in the chat for anyone that wants. Anyone that cannot afford Septuagint. So let's see here. All right, we're going to be starting soon. I think we're live. Yep, we're streaming live right now. We're live, everyone. Shalom, I'm Brother Doug with my brothers and sisters here by the wake, uh, from the Waking by, by Yahuwah Fellowship Assembly and Yahuwah Almighty and Yahushua Messiah. Um, we're going to be doing a study today as we usually do. We usually do these half Torah Torah readings. So we're going to start with the Torah portion of Genesis 32, verse 4 to 36, 43. As usual, I'm going to put up my Word software for you guys because it's one of the best softwares out there for parallel studies. So um, I'm able to actually read the Targum on Kalos for free actually on here. So let me see here. I'm going to go to compare, click on this tab, compare view. All right, let me get off of there. LXXE and on Kalos, check that. And we're going to go to Genesis. 32 verse 4 and let me make sure that i'm going to be recording to the cloud too so here we go record to the cloud all right we're on the cloud now also so we're going to start at genesis 32 verse 4 all right here we go and Jacob departed for his journey and having looked up he saw the army of Alua encamped and the angels of Alua met him. So we already have a difference there. Uh, Masoretic and Targum leave out army of Alua. So that's interesting. Anyway, moving on to verse two. Um, Jacob said when he saw them, this is the camp of Alua. And he called the name of the place encampments. Okay. Mana, mana name. Yeah. Mana name would be the transliteration. Again, the Septuagint a lot of times mm -hmm. will give you the definition instead of the transliteration. Mm -hmm. ya and Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, to his brother, to the land of Sire, to the country of Edom. That's going to be very important later mm -hmm. in our half Torah reading. That's going to be very important. So we see that the land that is Esau's por uh, portion that he has or his inheritance is Edom. And he charged them, saying, Thus shall you say to my master Esau, thus says your servant Jacob, Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and tarried until now. Okay. And there were born to me oxen and donkey and sheep and men servants and women servants. And I sent to my master Esau that your servant might find favor in your sight and the messengers returned to Jacob, saying we came to your brother Esau and lo he comes to meet you 400 men with him so now Jacob's getting afraid here he sees uh he thinks Esau's gonna attack him and Jacob was greatly terrified and was perplexed and he divided the people that was with him and the cows and the camels and the sheep into two camps or armies as the Kalo says here Okay. And Jacob said, if Esau should come to one camp and smite it, the other camp shall be in safety. And Jacob said, the Alua of my father Abraham, the Alua of my father Isaac, O Yahuwah, you, he, you are he that said to me, depart quickly to the land of your birth. And I will do you tob or good. Let there be to me a sufficiency of all the right ruling and all the truth which you have worked with your servant. For with this, my staff, I passed over this Jordan. And now I become two camps. Okay. Deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I am afraid of him, lest happily he should come and smite me 
and the mother upon the children. Okay. But you said, I will do you good and will make your seed as the sand of the sea, which shall not be numbered for multitude. Obviously, this goes back to even the promise he made to Abraham. It was carried over from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, the same covenant promise. So we see Yahuwah keeps his promises. And actually, he from covenant to from one covenant to another, he keeps the same promise. Okay. And he slept there that night and took of the gifts which he carried and sent out to Esau, his brother, 200 she-goats, 20 he-goats. That's interesting. It doesn't mention what type of... That's interesting. Don Kalos doesn't mention whether male or female goat. It's interesting. 20 she-goats, uh, 20 he-goats, 200 sheep, and 20 rams, okay. Milch camels and their foals, 30, 40 kine, 10 bulls, 20 donkeys, and 10 colts. Okay, moving on. And he gave them to his servants, drove apart, and he said to his servants, go on before me and put a space between drove and drove. Okay, moving on. And he charged the first saying, if Esau, my brother, meet you, and he asks you, saying, whose are you and where where would you go? I think the British English is trying to say here, where would, where did you come from? And whose are these possessions advancing before you? You shall say, your servant Jacob's, he has sent gifts to my master Esau. And lo, he is behind us. And he charged us, char my bad. And he charged the first and second and third and all that went before him after these flocks saying, thus shall you speak to <coughs> Esau when you find him. And you shall say, behold, your servant Jacob comes after us before he said, I will propitate his countenance with gifts going before his presence and afterwards i will behold his face for a per adventure he will accept me very interesting propitate that's kind of interesting says pacify so meaning like uh the reason i thought propitate's interesting because the greek word propitate can mean a tone mm -hmm. so i kind of find it interesting yeah pacify did not mean that yeah Pro, would mean like, humor, like, like in the, in the Greek, like, I'll give you an example in the King James Greek New Testament, it will, instead of the English word atone, they actually use the word propitate for what oh, Yahushua did for okay. our sins. Okay. So it's the same exact Greek word. So I just find that interesting. Yeah. Well, whether there's any messianic significance in that verse, I just find it interesting. Very different uh, though. That's uh, for sure. Yeah. So the presence went on before him but he himself lodged that night in the camp. Okay. And he rose in that night and took his two wives and his two servant maids and his 11 children and crossed over the ford of the Yabuk. Okay. And he took them and passed over the torrent and brought over all his possessions. Okay. Let's see here. We got a guest coming in here. All right. Whoever comes in, just make sure you're muting yourselves because we're doing a reading right now. Thank you, Thank you very much. Sorry. It's okay. No problem. No problem. And Yaakov was left alone and a man wrestled with him till the morning. Okay. I'm pretty sure we know who that is. Uh, let's see here. Moving on. So this angel of Yahuwah as a man is wrestling with Jacob. And he saw that he prevailed not against him. And he touched the broad part of his thigh. And the broad part of Jacob's thigh was benumbed in his wrestling with him. And he said to him, let me go for the day has dawned. But he said, I will not let you go except you brock me. Now, what it's saying here is basically that sunrise, that the daylight hours 
has has happened. Not that the day starts at sunrise. Okay, it's basically saying that morning has started. The sun has risen. And he said to him, what is your name? And he answered, Yaakov. And he said to him, your name shall no longer be called Yaakov, but Yasher Al, or in our English translations, Israel, shall be your name. For you have prevailed with Alua and shall be mighty with men. So the, this angel is calling himself Alua or Alihim. So that's very interesting to me. Um, okay. And Yaakov asked and tell me, asked and said, tell me your name. And he said, wherefore do you ask after my name? And he brute him there. Now, what's interesting is that there's a little bit added here. I don't know if it's going to come into the next verse, but it says here in the Uncolos, the angel of Yahuwah, I have seen the angel of Yahuwah mm -hmm. face to face, mm -hmm. and my soul has been saved. Yeah. Who is the angel of Yahuwah? I would ask that to the viewers and the listeners. Seems pretty clear to me who, who he is. And Yaakov called the place of that place the face. I mean, the Septuagint just plain out tells you. The face or image of Alua. For he said, I have seen Alua face to face and my life was preserved. So you have the Targum Uncolo saying the, the angel of Yahuwah saved him. The Septuagint says Alua himself has saved him. I would assert to you it's saying the same exact thing, just in a different way. Mm -hmm. It's the same exact person. The angel of Yahuwah is Yahuwah. That's right. Okay, so we're going to move to verse 31. And the sun rose upon him. So that's, again, the context there. It's talking about the sunrise. When he passed the face. So he called that place the face or image mm -hmm. of Alua, which is interesting. And he halted upon his thigh. Okay. Therefore, the children of Yashral will by no means eat of the sinew, which was benumbed, which is on the broad part of the thigh until this day, because the angel touched the broad part of the thigh of Jacob, even the sinew, which was benumbed. And then uh, what's interesting here, I think the verse numbers are a little bit off because the Uncalus has Jacob ya lifted up his eyes. Yeah, so the Uncalus is like a, a verse ahead a little bit, so not a big deal. So we're going to continue on here. Um, I did want to mention here just as a little tidbit before we start 33, just one little reference here. We see here that the host of Alua is mentioned as angels. So you'll see that a lot of times in the scriptures, the host of heaven is referred to as stars. They're like one and the same. So just thought I would mention that. So that's why I personally believe stars are the same thing as angels. Okay. Anyway, so starting in chapter 33. And Jacob lifted up his eyes and beheld lo, east out his brother coming and 400 men with him and Yaakov divided the children to Leah and to Rachel and the two handmaidens. Okay. And he put the two handmaidens and their children with the first and Leah and her children behind and Rachel and Yosef passed. Okay. But he advanced himself before them and did reference to the ground seven times until he drew near to his brother. And Esau ran on to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him. And they both wept. And Esau looked up and saw women and the children and said, what are these to you? And he said, the children with which Alua has mercifully Baruch your servant and the maids and their children drew near and did reverence. And Leah and her children drew near and did reverence. And after this, drew near Rachel and Yosef and did reverence. 
And he said, what are these things to you and all these companies that I have met? And he said, that your servant might find favor in your sight, my master. And Esau said, I have kept much, my brother. Keep your own, meaning you don't have to give me gifts. And Jacob said, if I found favor in your sight, receive the gifts through my hands. Therefore, have I seen your face as if, let's, let's read every word is important here, as if anyone should see the face of Alua. He's not saying Esau is, is Yahusha. Yeah. Okay. Every word uh. matters here. Okay. If, just like in Exodus 7, when he says, as his mighty one, when referring to Moses to Pharaoh, okay, not not that he's literally his mighty mm -hmm. one. So I think it's very important that I just wanted to bring this up that we got to take every word in context here, okay. As if anyone should see the face of Alua. Whoops, stupid thing. I was down to verse eight here. I don't know why I did that. Uh, what the heck? Sorry about that, guys. I don't know why I did that. This stupid thing likes to play around sometimes. All right, check mark. All right, okay. Okay, why is it weird like that? Hold on, there we go. Yeah, I don't, I don't like the across like that. I'll get confused there. All right, so here, keep your own. Verse 10, as if should see the face of Alua and you sh shall be well pleased with me. So basically he's saying, I want to seek favor with you like I would seek favor with the Alim of our, our fathers, basically. Receive my barakas, which I have brought you because Alua has had mercy on me and I have all things. And he constrained him and he took. And he said, let us depart and proceed right onward. Okay. Okay. And he said to him, my master knows that the children are very tender and the flocks and the herds with me are with young. If then, excuse me, I shall drive them hard one day and all the cattle will die. Okay, nothing really to explain there. Onward here. Let my master go on before his servant. I shall have strength on the road according to the ease of the journey. Okay. Before me and according to the strength of the children until I come to my master to Sair. And Esau said, I will leave with you some of the people who are with me. And he said, why so? It is enough that I have found favor before you, master. And Esau returned on that day on his journey to Sair. Okay. Okay. That's interesting. It mentions Jacob returning to Sukkoth okay. here. Uh, okay, uh, again, I got to keep reminding myself the verse numbers are not exactly um, equal there. One's before the other. Okay, verse 17, and Jacob departs to his tents and he made for himself their habitations and for his cattle, he made booths. Again, this kind of, to me, it kind of foreshadows tabernacles here, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Um, therefore, he called the name of that place booths. And that's the same Greek word used for feast tabernacles when you get to... Um, Leviticus 23 is the same Greek word there. Okay. And Jacob called, came to Salem. Now this is pretty prophetic here because, you know, you know, uh, the king of Salem and uh, Melchizedek and all that. So this seems to be pretty prophetic here. Uh, a city of Sakima, which is in the land of Canaan. When he departed out of Mesopotamia of Syria and took up a position in front of of the city so mesopotamia of syria would be what's interesting yeah that's weird it's not mentioning mesopotamia syria in the targum that's interesting and he brought the portion of the field where he pitched his tent of emor the father of sikhem for a hundred lambs wow okay and he set up there an altar and called on the Alua of Yashar. Oh. And I think in your Hebrew, it'll say um, Elohe Yisrael or Yasharel. I, I forget what it, it actually is. Uh, says in the Hebrew, like El Elohe. Right. Yeah. So. <clears throat> and Dina, 
the daughter of Leah, whom she bare to Yaakov, went forth to see the daughter. Oh, yeah. So again, now we're going to get to, let's see here. I think we're in chapter 34 now. Now, this is the story of Dina. And what I want to mention before we read 34, we need to take any personal biases we have on the text, any headers that we have in our translations, because again, these are Christian theologians putting headers on 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 uh, chapter sections so we got to be careful not to just take their word for it um you know so you might have a header that says you know dina was raped but we're gonna actually read scripture to see whether that's true or not okay um so chapter 34 verse 1 and dina the daughter of leah whom she bore to yaakov went forth to observe the daughters of the inhabitants in sikem the son of emor the hivite the ruler of the land saw her and took her and lay lay with her and humbled her. Okay, so humbled her does not mean rape. It can literally just mean you can see this phrase being used in the Torah where Yahuwah says there are certain women of the captives when you take over these other nations that you don't have to utterly destroy. That you can take their women <clears throat> and you can let them mourn and grieve for their relatives and all that and talks about shaving their head and all that and then you can humble them and make her your wife. So this is just talking about in general that she was humbled by this Hivite man and um, there's there's no context here that would say she was raped. There's no so that's more of a, a, a translator bias. And he attached to the soul of Dina, meaning he actually fell in love with her, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the damsel, and he spoke kindly to the damsel. Sikem spoke to Emor, his father, saying, take for me this damsel to wife. And Jacob heard that the son of Emor had defiled Dina, his daughter, because obviously he slept with her, you know, before marriage before being in covenant. So that's why he would defile her, um, you know, whoring sexual morality, you know, they may, they're mad because, you know, their sister has now become a whore. Um, Yaakov heard that the son of Emor had defiled Dina, his daughter. Now his sons were with his cattle in the plain and Yaakov was silent until they came. And Emor, the father of Kem, went forth to Yaakov to speak to him. And the sons of Jacob said to the plain when they heard, the men were deeply pained and it was very grievous to them because the man worked folly in Yashrael and having lain with the daughter of Jacob, so it must not be. Okay. And Emor spoke to them saying, Shechem, my son, has chosen it in his heart, your daughter. Give her, therefore, to him for a wife. And intermarry with us, give us your daughters and take our daughters for your sons. Now, mind you too, this is in the context of even before the law of Moses, right? There's certain tribes because of the curse of Canaan that they're not supposed to intermarry. We got to keep that in mind too. This guy has a Hivite. So by under no circumstances, can they intermarry with him based on the curse now, we're not even getting to the part of scripture where it talks, Yahuwah elaborates specifically why he doesn't want them intermarrying and about the idolatry thing. We haven't gotten to that part in the law of Moses yet. This is pre-law of Moses. This is just, you. the only context we have is after the flood, Ham did what he did and his son was cursed instead of him being cursed. And these tribes come from him, come from Canaan, his son. So Yahuwah doesn't want his promised people the line of his inheritance to be intermingling with a cursed lineage that that would, you know, basically be a stumbling block to all the promises he's giving to the seed of Abraham, if that makes any sense, okay? Um, so Emor spoke to them saying, Sekem, my son has chosen his heart, your daughter, give her therefore to him for a wife and intermarry with us, give us your daughters, and take our daughters for your sons and dwell in the midst of us. And behold, the land is spacious before you dwell in it and trade and get possessions in it. And Sakem said to her father and to her brothers, I would find favor before you. We will give whatever you shall name. 
Okay, so it says multiply dowry very much and give accordingly as you shall say to me, only you shall give me this damsel for a wife. And the sons of Yaakov answered to Sekem and Emor, his father craftily, so now they're deceiving this guy, um, and spoke to them because they had, they had defiled Dina, their sister. Okay. And Simon and Levi, the brothers of Dina, said to them, okay, now, of course, it's got to be stupid in doing that. All right, let's see here. Multiply your dowry. Okay. Yeah. We, let's see. Simon and Levi, the brothers of Dina, said to them, we shall not be able to do this thing, to give you our sister to a man who is uncircumcised, for it is a reproach to us. Only these terms we will comfort to you and dwell among you if you also will be as we are in that every male of you be circumcised. Okay. And we will give our daughters to you and we will take of your daughters for wives to us and we will dwell with you and we will be as one ethnos or one race. But if you will not hearken to us to be circumcised, we will take our daughter and depart. And the words pleased him more, and Shechem, the son of Emor, and the young man delayed not to do this, for he was much attained to Jacob's daughter, and he was the most honorable of all in his father's house. Okay. And Emor and Sikkim, his son, came to the gate of their city and spoke to the men of their city, saying, These men are peaceable. Let them dwell with us upon the land and let them trade in it. And behold, the land is extensive before them. And we will take their daughters to us for wives and we will give them our daughters. Only on these terms will the men conform to us to dwell with us so as to be one people if every male of us be circumcised as they also are circumcised and shall not their cattle and their herds and their possessions be ours only in this let us conform to them and they will dwell with us okay and all that went in at the gate of their city hearkened to Emor and Sekem, his son, and they were circumcised in the flesh of their foreskin, every male. Okay. And it came to pass on the third day when they were in pain, the two sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dina's brothers, took each man his sword and came upon the city securely and slew every male. And they slew Emor and Sekem, his son, with the edge of the sword and took Dina out of the house of Sekem and went forth. But the sons of Jacob came upon the wounded and ravaged the city wherein they had defiled Dina, their sister, and their sheep, and their oxen, and their donkeys. And they took in all things whatsoever were in the city and whatsoever were in the plain. And they took captive all the persons of them and all their store, excuse me, and their wives and plundered both whatever things there were in the city, whatever things there were in the houses, okay? And Yaakov said to Simeon and Levi, why have you made me hateful so that I should be evil to all the inhabitants of the land, both among the Canaanites, Perizzites, and I am few in number. They will gather themselves against me and cut me in pieces, and I shall be utterly destroyed and my house. And they said, nay, but shall they treat our sister as a harlot? So obviously we see the context again. What Dina did is not rape. She was consensual. They basically, um, the uh, Emor basically made her a harlot by having sexual morality with her. That's the context. And they're mad. They're like, should we allow them to, you know, have our sister as a whore, you know? And so obviously we see here that they're, they're acting out of, 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 you could say revenge or vengeance for their sister. 
Um, and so they, they, I believe Yahuwah caused this to happen before we go on to chapter 35. I believe Yahuwah caused this to happen as part of his plan mm -hmm. moving forward with those tribes. Um, Yahuwah used this for his purpose because he can, that way, you know, that's, you know, the, Iv the Hivites are one of those tribes eventually that are idolatrous, wicked giants in the land of Canaan that eventually, um, you know, he brings his people in, you know, after the law of Moses comes and he tells them you are not to intermarry with them because they are idolaters. You are not to do this with them. Do not make covenants with them. So it seems like Yahuwah is using this overzealousness with Jacob's sons for his purpose because they're trying to defend the honor of their sister. And he's looking at it as, okay, I can use this to get my will accomplished. And so that's the way I would look at it because I can see how some people would look at this like, this is evil what they did. You know, the guy was in love with their sister, but again, they're not supposed to intermarry with the Hivites. We got to keep that in mind. They're not, these are pagan idolatrous nations that they are not supposed to intermarry into. So I know it seems kind of harsh if you're a non-believer reading this. It seems like very harsh, but this is part of Yahuwah's plan. So anyway, we're going to move on here. I'm not going to waste too much time on that chapter. That chapter is self-explanatory. Um, let's see here. Chapter 35. And Alua said to Jacob, arise, go up to the place Bethel. So now we're going back to the house of Alua here, um, you know, what, what Jacob called Bethel, and dwell there and make there an altar to Alua that appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother, okay? And here we go. Now Jacob's continuing here saying, and Jacob said to his house and to all that were with him, remove the strange mighty ones that are with you from the midst of you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. So we see a parallel here to when they get up to Mount Sinai and Moses commands all the people, you, you need to purify yourselves, you know, um, obviously ritually and, you know, righteousness wise. So ritualistically, they have to clean themselves, get new clothes on, purify themselves. In this case, it's also spiritual and physical. Get rid of the idols you have. So, and then let's see here. It says, verse three, let us rise, go up to Bethel, and let us make there an altar to Alua, who hearkened to me in the day of calamity, who was with me and preserved me throughout in the journey by which I went. Okay. All right. Verse four. And they gave to Yaakov the strange mighty ones which were in their hands and the earrings which were in their ears. And Yaakov hid them under the turban tree, which is in Sekem, <clears throat> and destroyed them to this day. Okay. Let's see here. So Yashur all departed from Sakim, Sakima, and the fear of Alua was upon the cities round about them, and they did not pursue after the children of Yashur all. And Yaakov came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, which is Bethel. He and all the people who were with him. And Yaakov came to Luza, which is in the land of Canaan, which is in Bethel. He and all the people that were with him. Okay. All right. Moving on to verse seven here. Um, let's see here. And he built an altar and called the name of the place Bethel. For there Alua appeared to him when he fled from the face of Esau. His brother. Now, what's interesting here is in the Targum version, it says the angel of Yahuwah appeared to him. So it's showing that Alahim, Alua, is the angel of Yahuwah. Okay. Verse 8 here. And Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died and was buried below Bethel under the oak. And Yaakov called its name the Oak of Mourning. Interesting. Okay. Verse 9. And Alua appeared to Yaakov once more in Luza when he came out of Mesopotamia of Syria. And Alua 
Baruch Tim. Okay. All right, verse 10. Your name, and Alua said to him, your name shall no more be called Yaakov, but Yasharal shall be your name. And he called his name Yasharal. And Alua said to him, I am your Alua, or I am your Alihim. Increase and multiply, for nations and gatherings of nations shall come of you, and kings shall come out of your loins. Okay. And the land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I give it to you, and it shall come to pass that I will give this land also to your seed after you. Verse 13. And Alua went up from him, from the place where he spoke with him. And Yaakov set up a pillar in the place where Alua spoke with him. And a pillar of the stone offered a libation upon it and poured oil upon it. Okay. Let's see here. And Yaakov called the name of the place in which Alua spoke with him Bethel, which basically means house of Alihim. Okay. Let's see here. Verse 16, and it came to pass when he drew near to Chabratha to enter into Ephratha, Rachel travailed, and in her travail, she was in hard labor. So it doesn't even mention Ephratha again, which is really strange. It does not mention him going into Ephratha. Verse 16, very weird. It's like they want to erase this place to Ephratha for some reason. Okay. And it came to pass in her hard labor that the midwife said to her, Be of good courage, for you shall also have a son. And it came to pass in her giving up the spirit, for she was dying that she called his name the son of my pain, but his father called his name Benjamin. Okay, my bad. I uh, I have to take that comment back. Ephratha is in this chapter. Okay, it's just two two verses later for some reason. Sorry about that. Apologize. Okay. So Rachel died and was buried in the way of the course of Ephratha. This is Bethlehem. We should pay attention to that name. That's going to be important. Remember, Ephratha, Bethlehem. Yeah, yeah. Michael five two. Anyone? Okay. <clears throat> All right. Yes. And Jacob set up a pillar on her tomb. Mm. I wonder if this is the origin of the uh, what we would call today a gravestone. I kind of wonder, you know, the headstone uh, set up a pillar on her tomb. This is the pillar on the tomb of Rachel unto this mm. day. All right. Obviously omitted here. Thank you, Vatican. Stupid. And let's see here. It came to pass just for fun. I want to see what what verse was omitted here. OK. It was while Yasharal dwelt in the land that Reuben went and laid with Bilhah, the concubine of his father, and Yasharal heard it. Yeah, thanks, Va Codex Vaticanus, for, you know, taking out that verse. Thank you very much. Stupid. And it came to pass when Yasharal dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bala, the concubine. Oh, okay, so it's not... I have to take that back then. It's not. Why is it saying omitted if it's stupid? No, it's not omitted. It's just part of the next verse. Instead of breaking it up, they just have it as one complete paragraph. Okay, I'm sorry. I apologize, everyone. Stupid word software. Why are you doing that? Making people believe something's omitted when it's not. And it came to pass when Yashrael dwelt in the land that Reuben went and lay with Bella, the concubine of his father, Yaakov, and Yashrael heard. And the thing appeared grievous before him. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. And the sons of Jacob were 12. So it seems like there's a spirit that is causing this, you know, uh, uh, uncovering the nakedness of his father and all that. So, uh, you know, we see Ham doing that previously. It's like this demonic spirit seemed to uh, keeps latching and uh, afflicting, uh, you know, Yasharal, and uh, we see this type of spirit in Reuben. Um, and later on, you'll see Paul, even in the Brit Hadashah, talking about it, talking about, brothers, why do you have your father's wife 
you know, even the pagans don't do such things. And, you know, Paul makes a, 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 you know, to really drive it home to one of the assemblies. Why are you doing such things? You know, okay. The concubines of Leah, the firstborn of Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Yehuda, Issachar, and Zabulon. So these are all sons of Leah. The sons of Rachel, Yosef, and Benjamin. The sons of Bala, the handmaid of Rachel, Dan and Naphtali, or Naphtalim. That's interesting, it's plural there. And the sons of Zelpha, the handmaid of Leah, Gad and Asher. These the sons of Yaakov, which were born to him in Mesopotamia of Syria. And Yaakov said to Isaac, his father, to Mamre, to a city of the plain, this is Hebron in the land of Canaan, where Abraham and Isaac sojourned. Okay. And the days of Isaac he lived were 183 years. And Isaac gave up the spirit and died and was laid to his family, old and full of days. And Esau and Jacob, his sons, buried him. Now, what's interesting here is in our modern versions in Genesis 6, right, one of the curses you know, that basically are put kind of like because of the flood, not really a curse, I should say, but more like a, a life expectancy, supposedly. So let me correct myself. It's not a curse, but the, the, because of sin, we are not supposed to live past 120 years. That's what our modern, modern versions say. Right. Mm -hmm. But here you have Isaac living 183 years, that life expectancy of 120 years. I could be wrong, but that doesn't even get put into place by Yahuwah until Moses is like dying. Mm -hmm. It's like way, 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 way into the, the law, you know, Mount, post Mount Sinai and all that, that that idea of a new life expectancy of 120 years. Um, I just would like to put the possibility up here, just put the possibility up here that the Targums might give us shed some little light that it's not just a life expectancy, but it might have been a time period allotment for repentance the last 120 years before the flood for mankind to repent. I'm just putting that um, I'm putting that up here as a possibility. Um, let me see here. Let me go to um, the Targum of Jonathan and show you guys what I'm talking about here. Um, because as far as 120 years being a lifespan, we really don't see that happening until Moses is dying from what I've seen. It's way, way after the flood, way, way after. Um, so I'm just putting this up as a possibility that it's also the 120 years could have also been referring to, not that it's not referring to a lifespan, but that also at that moment in time, when the flood was about to happen or, or 120 years before the flood, Yahuwah is telling them to repent. Um, okay, so let me see here. Um, and all the earth was corrupted. Okay, where does it talk about? Um, let's see here. Righteousness before Yahuwah, the earth was filled with rapine. Yahuwah beheld the earth and lo, it was corrupt in all flesh. And, okay, Yahuwah said to Noah, the all end of, by the evil, behold, I will destroy them with the earth. I always get confused which verse it's referring to when it talks about the 120 years. Okay, here. So the wicked man, measuring his heart was evil, continuing. So repented you who in his word had made upon the earth. He passed judgment on them by his word. And you who said, I will abolish by my word man whom I've created from the face of the earth from fell. Let's see here. Um, because I repent of that word that I've made them. Okay, what? Let's see. Hold on. I apologize, guys. I could have swore I knew exactly where to find this. Um, his days shall be 120 years. Let's see here. 6 3. Okay, yeah. Depending on the version, it should be 6 3 or 6 4. Let me see here. Thank you, Brother Jeff. Thank you. Um, so let's see here. Uh, yeah, here we go. This is what I was referring to. And you who has said by his word, Genesis 6, 3 and Targum Jonathan, all the generations of the wicked, which are shall rise, shall not be purged after the order of the judgments of the generation of the deluge, meaning no longer is he going to send a flood. He would never send a flood again. 
um, which shall be destroyed and exterminated from the midst of the world. Have I not imparted my set apart spirit to them or placed my set apart spirit in them that they may work good works? And behold, their works are wicked. Behold, I will give them a prolongment of 120 years that they may work repentance and not perish. So to me, that makes a little bit more sense why we see here, um, even with Genesis, what, 35 we just read, mm -hmm. that we have someone living to 183 years still. So that's all I'm saying. I'm just putting the possibility out there that we might be, that we might not be taking into consideration that, that he could have been also referring 120 years to them repenting, giving an allotment of time to repent before the flood came. So that's all I'm trying to say. Um, that Yahuwah was giving mankind a, a chance to repent um, and, and that the 120 years of a lifespan wouldn't have happened immediately like that. It would, it would have happened way later. That's all I was trying to say. But anyway, um, and Isaac gave up the spirit and died and was laid to his family, old and full of days, and Esau and Jacob, his sons, buried him. And so we see Isaac's died um, and uh who also died in this chapter, Rachel and Leah? Yeah, Rachel. Did Leah die too? Let me just check because I think they did. Um, let's see the sons of Leah. Sit up a pillar. Yeah, I mean, tomb of Rachel, verse 20. Rachel yeah, died. Rachel, but we were asking about Leah. Yeah. Uh, let's see, Leah. Maybe I got confused with the concubine of Leah. Maybe that's who died. Yeah. Yep. Go ahead, Gibsons. Yo, wasn't Leah the one who was smuggling the idol? Okay. <laughs> and Rachel was the good, the one that the good one, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rachel's the one that got buried in a place of honor in Abraham's bosom with the with the forefathers, right? Uh, and Leah didn't get that same burial, did she? No. No, she, no, she did not. It you doesn't look at all, there's a character difference between his two. I thought Rachel was the one that hid. Oh, sorry. I thought Rachel was the one oh, that hid the idols. And that, and, yeah. Let me check I, that. I thought yeah, I this is that let, me, let me check that. I want to check that and make sure we're we're uh correct here. Let's see. Uh, yeah, I think she's right about that. Who well, Rachel? Put the, I think I think I think I think you are. Long, yeah, that is. She's the one that lied. Uh, but they never did find the idols when they went. No, to Jacob told them to get rid of them. Oh, okay, okay. We just read in the chapter. Jacob told his family to mm -hmm, mm -hmm. get rid of them, and then he put it under a terebinth tree. We just read it in this mm -hmm. chapter. So, so the one that the one that hid the idol is not the one in the same that didn't get the better burial. Okay, never mind then. Never mind. I'm super sorry to pick us off. No, that, it's but. okay. It's okay. It's an easy mistake to make. I mean, I I actually thought it was Leia too. So I mean it Hey guys, it makes me feel good. I got something on you. <laughs> <laughs> you kept us from wandering and, and going off into conjecture and all that. That's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, so Genesis, anyone that's interested, that's Genesis 31, uh 34. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, pretty much Leia was kind of not in the right either because she could have stopped her sister. I mean, she could have been like, uh, let's not do that. Let's not curse ourselves by taking idol. You know, so the, she's kind of like it's an up. accomplice. We yeah. don't got to force it to fit. Never mind. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I'm not trying to force it. I'm just saying that you still got guilty by association. I think you who looks at that as, uh, you know, you're, uh, you know, like, uh, am I my brother's keeper? You know, type of thing like, you know, it, uh, you know, the we should like be helping each other out, you know. And so, yeah, I uh, I don't think you holds Leia, you know, completely innocent. Um, you know, so they they were coming. You got to understand, too, they're grown up in a pagan household. Like what what you this is actually a perfect topic about you mercy here. Um, because we obviously see Yahuwah allowing Jacob to tell them to take away uh, the idols. So, you know, you see Yahuwah, you know, Yahuwah could have punished them right then and there from bringing idols into his camp. Mm -hmm. But he's, you know, he's realizing he's dealing with former pagans here. You know, he's, he, he's, I don't know, I kind of see like a similar story to Abraham with, with them and how Yahuwah is, you know, you know, being... Um, extra merciful right now because they're they're coming from a pagan environment.
environment, they're coming from a pagan upbringing with Laban. So we got to understand that too. Um, I think it's important to understand. So, um, you know, but anyway, no, that, that was a good point. Thank you, Sister Sadia. That was a good point. So anyway, I just wanted to bring up the possibility the 120 might not be what we think it is because of the way of uh, the way we, uh, you know, look at the 120 years there in Genesis 6. Um, and, and really the lifespan, like I said before, or you can test it for yourselves. Really, you don't see people dying at 120 until way after the flood. So, uh, but sad that she died yeah. while having Benjamin, you know, she never really got yeah. a chance to even, you know, so that might have been a, a discipline on her. Oh yeah. No, you know, you definitely. Know. Definitely. She was disciplined. Yeah. yeah. She died from childbirth. I mean, that had something to do with her sin, I'm, I'm assuming. Um, I think so. So I, unless I see other righteous women in scripture just normally dying from childbirth, I would say that could have been you who was a little bit of you who was disciplined her. Yeah. Um, you know, just just a possibility. Yeah. But anyway, moving on, moving on. I don't want to beat this chapter to death. All right. Let's see here. <laughs> All right, here we go. Oh, boy, here we go again. These guys again. Here we go. And these are the generations of Esau. This is Edom. See, man, I'm getting a whole theme already of today's half to a man. It's all about Edom. Ugh, here we go. Esau took. Yeah, Esau, he's a really righteous guy here. Takes himself wives of the Canaanites. Uh, Ada, daughter of Elam, the Hittite. Oba Olibema, daughter of Anna, son of Zebagon, the Hivite. So you got Hivite, Canaanite, Hittite, and Basemoth, daughter of Yishmael, sister of Nabioth, and Ada bore to him Eliphaz, and Basemoth bore Raguel. So we can kind of see why Yahuwah hates Esau so far. Before this, he gets away his birth, he just gives away his birthright. Now he's doing this. Yeah, we can see why Yahuwah says, I have hated Esau and loved Jacob. I'm seeing anyway. There, there's many, many reasons for why Yahuwah hates Esau. All right. And Ada bore to him Eliphaz, and Basemath bore Raguel, and Ulibema bore Yahus, Yahus, and Yaglam, Korah. These are the sons of Esau which were born to him in the land of Canaan. I wonder if this is the same Korah that we see later on with the rebellion of Korah. I wonder if this is the same exact people or the people come from this, this uh, ancestor. I'm just curious um, in the land of Canaan. So, and Esau took his wives and his sons and his daughters and all the persons of his house and all his possessions and all his cattle and all that he had got and all the things whatsoever he had acquired in the land of Canaan. And Esau went from the land of Canaan, from the face of his brother, Jacob, for their substance was too great for them to dwell together. And the land of their sojourning could not bear them because the abundance of their possessions. And Esau dwelt in Mount Sire. Esau, he is Edom. Okay, so. And these are the generations of Esau. The father of Edom in Mount Seir. These are the names of the sons of Esau. Eliphaz, the son of Adah, wife of Esau. Raguel, son of Basemath, wife of Esau. The sons of Eliphaz were Taman, Omar, Sophar, Gotam, and Kenaz. wonder if that's uh, Kenazites, maybe? I wonder if that's where the Kenazites come from. Kenaz. I don't know. I'm going to... Keep a little note of verse 11 there. Um, Temna was a concubine of Eliphaz, the son of Esau, and she bore Amalek. Amalek, huh? That sounds similar to the Amalekites. That's kind of interesting because they become uh, enemies of Israel later on in scripture. So I wonder if the Amalekites come from this Amalek guy. That would be interesting to find out. Um, these, the sons of Ada the wife of Esau, and these the sons of Raguel, Nakoth, Zare, Som, Moz, these were the sons of Basemoth, the wife of Esau. Hmm. And these the sons of Olibama, daughter of Anah, the son of Zaba, 
Zidagon, the wife of Esau, and she bore to Esau Yaus, Yaglam, and Korah. So again, mentioning Korah. He's the chief of the son of Esau, the sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn of Esau, chief Taman, chief Omar, chief Sophar, chief Kenes, chief Kor, chief Gotham, chief Amalek. These are the chiefs of Eliphaz in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Ada. And these, the sons of Raguel, the son of Esau, chief Nachoth, chief Zareh, chief Som, chief Moz. These, the chiefs of Raguel in the land of Edom, these are the sons of Basemath, wife of Esau. And these are the sons of Olibama, or Olibama, wife of Esau, chief Yaus, chief Lagam, chief Korah. These are the chiefs of Olibama, wife, oh no, what? Uh, daughter of Anna, wife of Esau. These are the sons of Esau, and these are the chiefs, these are the sons of Edom. Okay. Verse 20. And these are the sons of Sair, the Horite, who inhabited the land, Lotan, Sobal, Sebagon, Anna, and Desan, and Asar, and Rizan. These are the chiefs of the Horite, the son of Sair, in the land of Edom. And the sons of Lotan, Hori, Haman, the sister of Lotan, Tamna, these are the sons of Sobal, Golam, Manacha, and Gebal, and Sofar, and Omar. And these, the sons of Sebagan, Ai, and Ana. This is Ana who found Yamin in the wilderness when he tended the beasts of his father, Sebagan. And these, the sons of Anna, Desan, and Olibema, the daughter of Anna. And these, the sons of Desan, Amada, Azban, Ethran, and Karhan. And these, the sons of Asar, Balaam. That's important to note there, Balaam. And Zukam and Yukam. Let's see here, okay. And these are the sons of Rizan, Hos, and Aran. And these are the chiefs of Hori, Chief Lotan, Chief Sobal, Chief Sebagan, Chief Ana, Chief Desan, Chief Azar, Chief Rizon. These are the chiefs of Hori in their principalities in the land of Edom. These are the kings which reigned in Edom. Now, this is where it's going to get really interesting. Before a king reigned in Israel, or Yashrael. Balak, son of Beor. So we just talked about Balaam. Now you got Balak, son of Beor, reigned in Edom. And the name of his city was Denaba. Balak died. And Yobab. Who is Yobab? We're going to, I'm going to go to the book of Job from the Septuagint after we finish this chapter and show you a little cool uh, connection here about Job's origins. You'll find interesting. Yobab, son of Zerah from Bosora reigned in his stead and Yobab died and Assam from the land of the Temanites reigned in his stead. So right now we're talking about like timeline. I would be thinking Balaam. So you're talking about around like what the book of numbers, probably, probably give or take um, Leviticus to numbers chronologically. So what, what Genesis is talking about, that's when, you know, Balaam would have been still alive around that time. So it's interesting. Um, from the land of Temanites reign in his stead, Asam died, Adad, son of Barad, who cut off Midian in the plain of Moab, ruled in his stead, and the name of his city was Gathaim. Okay. And Adad died, and Samada of Maseka reigned in his stead, and Samada died, and Shaul of Rehoboth by the river reigned in his stead, and Shaul died, and Balanon, the son of Akobor, reigned in his stead, and Balanon, son of Akobor, died, and Arad, son of Barad, reigned in his stead, and the name of his city was Fogor, and the name of his wife was Metabil, daughter of Matraith, son of Maizub, 
These are the names of the chiefs of Esau in their tribes, according to the place in their countries and in their nations, Chief Tamna, Chief Gola, Chief Yether. Okay. The Chief Olibema, Chief Heles, Chief Finun, Chief Kenez, Chief Teman, Chief Mazar, Magadiel, Chief Zafoin. These are the chiefs of Edom and their dwelling places in the land of their possession. This is Esau, the father of the Edomites. Now, what I want to do before we go to Genesis 36 for our last part of the Torah portion for today, I want to go to the book of Job of the Septuagint, show you how um, I believe Yobab is Job. This person, Yobab, they're mentioning as reigning in Edom. Okay, um, if we go to the last chapter of the book of Job, um, and we can take the comparing off because there's not a, uh, let's see here, I don't think there's going to be anything there. What we could do is use the Masoretic here for the other part of Job. Okay, all right. So if we go all the way down here, you're going to see an interesting uh, what they would consider Greek additions to the book of Job, quote unquote. <laughs> All right. And Job died an old man. So this would be verse 17. And there's like a whole extra ch chapter pretty much here to the last um, chapter of Job. Job died an old man in full of days. And it was written that he will rise again with those whom Yahuwah raises up, meaning he's going to be in the resurrection. This man is described in the Syriac book. So this seems to come from a Syriac manuscript in origin, which is interesting. Um, living in the land of Uz on the borders of Edumia in Arabia. And his name before, probably before, I'm just speculating here. I can't say this for doctrine, but probably it's referred to before him being a Hebrew, before in his conversion, was Yobab. And having taken an Arabian wife, he begot a son whose name was Enon, and he himself was the son of his father Zareh, one of the sons of Esau, and of his mother Bosora, so that he was the fifth from Abraham. And these were the king who reigned in Edom, which country he also ruled over, first Balak, the son of Behor, of Beor, we just talked about him in Genesis 30. Uh, what was it, 35, Mom? We just read 30, yeah, 35. So, yeah, yeah, so you can cross this the Greek version of Job here with um Genesis 35, talking about Balak. And the name of his city was Denabah, but after Balak, Yobab, who's called Job, after him, Assam, who was the governor out of the country of Taman, and after him, Adad, the son of Barad, who destroyed Madiam in the plain of Moab, and the name of his city was Gathaim. And friends who came with him were Eliphaz of the children of Esau. So according to the Septuagint version of Job, Eliphaz is also Edomite by birth, um, king of the Tamanites, Baldad, uh, son of the Sekulians, so far is king of the Minions. So what's interesting, too, is like if you read Job, Eliphaz is a very righteous guy. Mm -hmm. He's like the young guy that pretty much, if I'm not mistaken, that's the young one that's like, I know I'm not as old as you brothers, but I know mm -hmm. something myself. So Eliphaz seems to have converted also mm -hmm. to be a believer, just like his other friends, you know. So it seems like Job is actually a physical Edomite. And I pray that Brothers and sisters, pay attention to this because this shows your ethnicity means nothing, okay? Yahuwah can take an Edomite and mm -hmm. make him one of his sons, okay? So just put that out there, okay? So that, and that's perfect definition of grafting in. So that's the reason I wanted to bring that up too, okay? So anyway, okay, we're going to move on here. I think uh, I talked enough about that. We can move on to our last chapter genesis uh i apologize for taking a little rabbit trail there but i thought it was necessary to show the connection between job and yobab there okay all right so we're going to go back to genesis now we're going to do the last chapter genesis and we'll move on to another reader 
Okay, so we're going to go to Genesis 36. All right. Okay, Genesis 36. And these are, oh no, we just read. Okay, we read 36. Okay, my bad. All right, we're done. We're done with Genesis. Sorry, guys. My brain is not 100% capacity today. All right, so we're actually done with Genesis. So what I think we're going to do is we're going to take a look on um, what we have next to read. If I'm not mistaken, Obadiah is next, if I'm not mistaken. But I just want to double check to make sure I'm going in the right order here. Okay, so Genesis, yep, so Obadiah chapter 1, I think, Mom, would you be able to read Obadiah chapter sure. 1 for us? Sure. It's a very short chapter, so, yeah, yeah. okay, and after that, I think we're, we're going to have to start a new recording. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, sure. No problem, Brother Joshua. I can actually send you a copy and paste either from my Word software, where it has it has it from verse 17 all the way down to the extra portion in Job, or from eSword. So either way, I think I think the MySword might have it on the LXXE. I would have to check, though. I'm not too sure. They should have it on um, Job chapter 40 um, all the way at the end. Usually it's in blue when it when they want to consider considerate editions and all that usually it's in like a blue font um so yep go ahead mom okay uh the vision of obadiah this is what the sovereign yahuwah says about edom we have heard a message from the elohim an envoy was sent to the nations to say rise and let us go against her for battle see i will make you small among the nations you will be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the cleft of the rocks and make your home on the heights, you who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground, though you soar like the eagle and make your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares Yahuwah. If thieves came to you, if robbers in the night, Oh, what a disaster awaits you. Would they not steal only as much as they wanted? If grape pickers came to you, would they not leave a few grapes? But how Esau will be ransacked, his hidden treasures pillaged. All your allies will force you to the border. Your friends will deceive and overpower you. Those who eat your bread will set a trap for you, but you will not detect it. In that day, declares Yahuwah, will I not destroy the wise men of Edom, men of understanding in the mountains of Esau. Your warriors, O Taman, will be terrified, and everyone in Esau's mountains will be cut down in the slaughter because of the violence against your brother Jacob. You will be covered with shame. You will be destroyed forever. On the day you stood aloof while strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem. You were like one of them. You should not look down on your brother in the day of his misfortune, nor rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor boast so much. In the day of their trouble, you should not march through the gates of my people in the day of their disaster, nor look down on them in their calamity in the day of their disaster, nor seize their wealth in the day of their disaster. You should not wait at the crossroads to cut down their fugitives, nor hand over their survivors in the day of their trouble. The day of Yahuwah is near for all nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your deeds will return upon your own head. Just as you drank on my holy hill, or set apart hill, so all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and drink and be as if they had never been before. But on Mount Zion will be deliverance. It will be set apart. And the house of Jacob will possess its inheritance. 
The house of Jacob will be a fire and the house of Joseph a flame. The house of Esau will be stubble and they will set it on fire and consume it. There will be no survivors from the house of Esau. Yahuwah has spoken. People from the Negev will occupy the mountains of, I have this highlighted so well, of Esau. And people from, give me a second, people from the, I'm going to put some more light on for you. I think you're having a hard time reading. <laughs> well, I also have it highlighted pretty dark, so. I'm if you need to me to take over, I can take over. And people from the um, something hills, I can't make out. Foothills? What verse are you on? Um, I'm on night. I think. 19. They that dwell in the south shall inherit the mountain of Esau. They in the plain, the Philistines, or the plain oh, of, of the Philistines, they shall inherit the Mount of Ephraim and, and the plain of Samaria and Benjamin and the land of Gilead. Mm -hmm. This is the domain of the captivity of the children of Yashural and the land of the Canaanites as far as Sarepta. So now it's going back to you who has promised mm -hmm. giving that land to his people. As far as Ephra, I really see how they did this Torah portion today. I'm really seeing a lot of connections here. Okay, they they put this together so Ephrata is like a main main location in the, in today's Torah portion. Okay, I see what they're doing. Yeah, they shall inherit the cities of the south, and they that escape shall come up from Mount Sion to take vengeance on the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be who has. Where have we seen that before? Oh, that reminds me of other prophets. Okay, let's go to uh, the book of Daniel here. Daniel chapter 7 comes to mind here. I got a bunch of notes for this chapter. Uh, let me just find Daniel real quick. Yeah, Daniel 7, 18. Okay. Kingdom shall be Yahuwah's, but let's actually go to verse 13, which is... I beheld in the night vision, lo, coming with the clouds of heaven as the son of man. And he came unto the ancient of days. Here's the oneness here. You got the son and the father, son of man, ancient of days, and was brought near to him. And to him was given dominion. Sounds like to me it's saying the son of man is given the kingdom and honor and king and the kingdom, Obadiah 121. And all nations, tribes, and languages shall serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and shall not, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom shall not be destroyed. Now we can go to verse 18 of this chapter also. So it says, oh, so we could even start at verse 17 here. These four beasts are four kingdoms. See, this is an important thing to understand with prophecy too. Prophecy defines itself. Okay, the, the angel is telling him what these beasts are. So when a beast in a, is, a, is a kingdom, it will tell you it's a kingdom. So a lot of people read like Revelation 17 and think the beast, the beast is a kingdom. Mm -hmm. No, it's referring to a person. It's not a kingdom in that context. The, the angel is telling him in this context in Daniel that mm -hmm. these four beasts are kingdoms and not kings. Because it clearly says it here. Mm -hmm. Um shall rise up on the earth which shall be taken away and the set apart ones of the most high shall take the kingdom meaning the last beast kingdom which in my opinion i'm going to give you some scriptures to support my belief i believe edom is one in the same as the last beast kingdom and edom connects even to the mother harlot that we know of revelation 17 um which shall be taking away the set part ones of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess it forever and ever. Mm -hmm. And the reason I believe this, that Edom connects or even is one and the same as the last beast kingdom, um, I want to go to the Targum of Jonathan here and show you something pretty cool, I think, um, which actually would connect technically. If this is legit and true, and uh, this is factual, then this would connect to the book of Daniel with the four beasts. So I'm going to go here. Let's see here, chapter 15. Now, you're not going to see this in your regular, uh, your regular translations, but you will see it in the Targums. 
and I'll show you two different targums that that pretty much say the same thing with this. Um, I'll use the targum of Jonathan first, and then the Jerusalem targum, which gives you the Aramaic names for these same nations. Um, okay, so. 15 verse 13 of Genesis of the Targum of Johnson says, and he said to Abraham, knowing you must know that your son shall dwell in the land. Okay. So they have it actually in verse 12. My bad. Okay. All right. And when the sun was nearing to set a deep sleep was thrown on Abraham and behold, four kingdoms arose to enslave his children. Terror, which is Babel. Babylon, darkness, which is Madai, media, media Persia, greatness, which is Yavan, which uh, I guess means the Greeks, Yavan, mm -hmm. Yavan is like an Aramaic name, I guess, for the Greeks, decline, which is Ferez, which is to fall and have, and to have no uplifting from where it is to be that the children of Israel will come up. Now, the reason I believe Yavan is actually this would be I'm trying to think if you got the Greeks. Let's see. I'm gonna to go to the Targum, the Jerusalem Targum, because they actually put it in English for us English speaking people um, in the same verse to help us out with the last two kingdoms there that are in Arabic. Um, okay, so it's the same exact, it's literally the same exact prophecy, it's just in a in, in a different targum. So it talks about terror, greatness fell upon them that is babel darkness that is media media persia greatness that is greece so i guess yavan is greece fell that is edom and they put in parentheses rome that fourth kingdom which is to fall never to rise again forever and ever so at least in their mind the people that wrote the targums these judeans from the first century a.d in their mind the last beast kingdom would have been edom aka rome which we're kind of seeing that in, in, in nowadays, seeing that somewhat, there's somewhat proof to that. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to bring that up. And uh, so let me go into some more cross references here. Why I think this is completely end times context, what my mom just read. If you go to, let's see here, we already did that stuff. If you go to... Okay, Malachi, we're going to go to Malachi 4.3 because there's a cross reference here talking about they would be stubble. Esau would be stubble under their feet or Edom would be stubble under their feet. So we're going to go to, back to Obadiah and we're going to go into this, the pride of the heart, bring me down to the ground. Da -da 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 -da. Okay, hidden things detected. Mountain of Esau, your warriors from Taman. Okay, from the day that you stood foreigners, okay. All right, neither should you have gone, neither pressed. For the day of you who is near upon all the Gentiles, as you have done, so shall it be to you. You shall be repay, your repayment shall be on your head. For as you have drunk upon my set apart mountain, shall all the nations drink wine. They shall drink and go down and be as if they were not. But on Mount Sion, there shall be salvation. There shall be a set apart place. The house of Jacob shall take for an inheritance those that took them for an inheritance. So basically, those that took Jacob captive, Jacob's going to take them captive. Okay. The house of Jacob shall be for. Here we go. Verse 18. So Obadiah 118. Um, I'm going to cross with. Malachi 4.3 and showing that it's the same context here. It talks about Jacob will be as fire, the house of jo Joseph a flame, the house of Esau shall be for stubble. Okay. And we've if we go to Malachi 4.3, says the same thing about the wicked. And you, sh and you shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes underneath your feet in the day which I appoint, says Yahuwah Almighty. So again, this, this is talking about Yahuwah's people, Jacob, literally trampling the wicked. And they being ashes under their feet or stubble under their feet. So I just wanted to make that connection there. Okay. We already talked about Ephrathah earlier. Okay. And let's see here. There's one. I want to. There's one more cross reference, and we can continue on to our next part of the study, 
Um, I wanted to go to Obadiah again, where it talks about the clefts of the rocks and how that ties to revelations and other prophetic books here. Uh, snares under you. Do, 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 do. Destruction. Okay, let's see here. Day of you who is near. Um, the house of Jacob, flame of fire. Okay. The south shall inherit the mount of Esau, and this shall be the domain. All right. Do you remember what verse mom is? The cleft of the rocks. Where it talks about that. That es Esau will be. Uh, oh, I know where it is. It's it's earlier in the chapter where it talks about the eagle and all that. Yeah, where I will bring you down. Um, says Yahua. Yeah, here we go. Verse three. This is an interesting paradigm here, talking about your heart is elated, exalted, dwelling in the holes of the rocks. Now, what's interesting here? This is a different paradigm from what happens later on about holes in the rocks but it shows that they you know they're they're exalted in the holes of the rocks now if you go to let's see i think we're going to start with isaiah 220 in an end times context it shows that it's talking about the wicked hiding in the holes of the rocks okay so isaiah 220 okay But if you will not be willing, do not hearken, uh, nor hearken to me. A sword shall devour you, for the mouth of Yahuwah has spoken this. And let's see here. Am I on the right book here? No, it's not the right verse, I don't think. Um, it starts in that day. In that day. Men will throw away to the rodents and bats their idols of silver. Oh, that's why I'm in chapter one instead of chapter two. <laughs> that That's why. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> For in that day, a man shall cast forth his silver abominations they made to worship vanities and uh, bat. Even though it says bats here, me and Joshua off the record actually looked more into the Greek of that word for bats. It's more correctly should be nocturnal. Mm. Okay, so like just uh, something about the night. They're worshiping the night or being nocturnals they're Thanks doing the doing stuff. wicked things at night possibly um all right so to enter into caverns of the solid rock okay so they're hiding from you here in context in verse mm -hmm. 21 to enter into the caverns of the solid rock into the clefts of the rocks for the fear of Yahuwah by reason of the esteem of his strength when he shall rise to strike terribly the earth and you can find tons of other cross references about this, about the clefts of the rocks. Mm -hmm. Hosea is another prophet that talks about this. Hosea chapter 10, mm -hmm. verse 8. And the altars on of on the sins of Israel shall be taken away. Thorns and thistles shall come up on their altars. And they shall say to the mountains, cover us. And to the hills, fall on us. What's interesting is referring to the sins of Israel. What's kind of interesting here, because usually we think about this as, especially in end times context, like we usually think about the kings of the nations, the 10 kings, all the wicked, you know, all the wicked in the world asking the rocks to fall on us. So it's interesting that it's referring to um, apostate Israel. That's kind of interesting in my opinion. Um, so let's, now we're going to go to Revelation 6.10. So now we're going into the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, okay? Revelation 6, 10, okay. <clears throat> and they cried with a loud voice saying, let's see, is that? Yeah. Okay, how long? Do, 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 okay, no, 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 that's, no, it's six sixteen. I want to look at, not six ten. Yes. And said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us. Hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. So we see the wicked here are asking rocks to fall on them. Mm -hmm. Sit on the throne from the wrath of the lamb. Mm -hmm. Okay. Psalms 2.12 can be connected to the wrath of the lamb. Okay. Psalms 2.12. All right. Okay. Kiss the son lest he be angry, 
you per and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Baruch are all they that put their trust in him. Okay, so that's Psalms 2.12. And the last one I have is Isaiah 2.10. And we'll move on to the next portion for today's study. So, and we'll probably take a small, small break if anyone needs a break to eat or anything. Okay. Um, let's see, Isaiah 2.10. Okay. The word which came to Isaiah, oh, let me just go to verse 10. Let me not read the whole thing there. Okay. Now, therefore, enter ye into the rocks and hide yourselves in the earth. For the fear of Yahuwah, and by the reason of the esteem of his might, his strength, when he shall rise to strike terribly the earth. Now, in context, is talking about the day of Yahuwah, the day of his wrath. So it's talking about all the way. Um, so somehow there's a context between Edom, the, the descendants of Esau and the wicked. Um, probably the wicked are spiritually yoked to Edom, I would say, is probably the, the way to reconcile that. You got prophecy in, in the book of Obadiah we just read and how it connects to end times and how it connects to this, what I believe to be the last beast kingdom, um, which, you know, most people would believe the mother harlot to be the Vatican, the seven hills that she sits on and all that. So I believe that there is a legitimate connection between um, Rome and Edom. So anyway, so um, I hope everyone got something out of this so far. We did the Genesis Torah portion and the prophets portion will be back soon. Um, and we'll be picking um, someone else to read and we'll be going next. Let me just get what we're reading next here and we'll end the recording here. Okay. Okay, so we will be reading next 1 Samuel and the book of Psalms. So please stay tuned, everyone. We're going to have a short, brief intermission. Shalom.